I felt very alienated from the whole thing. Uh, the messages I got about what it was like when I was growing up. Okay, I was born in 1943. When I was growing up in the 50s, the messages I got about what my sexuality was supposed to be is what was the standard fare for females. Uh, I was supposed to grow up, get married to some guy, produce you know, the usual 2.3 children, and sex wasn't even discussed in my family. I remember, um, I think it was in the second grade, um, yeah, I came, I came to school one day and little Melvin told, was telling everybody how babies were made. And my response was, my parents would never do anything like that. And I went home and I said, but everybody else believed him. I went home and I said to my mother, you know what little Melvin said? He was the shortest kid in our class. And she turned beet red and I thought, oh my God, it's true. And it was such a shock to me that that my mother would do that and that, you know, I had said that my parents wouldn't do that and it was just awful and disgusting. Okay, so a few years later, um, I'm still getting all these messages about what I'm supposed to feel for boys. And I didn't feel it and I didn't understand the other little girls giggling over guys and saying so-and-so was cute. I could look at a guy and say, well, objectively, he's good looking, but I didn't feel anything. And when I dated guys, which I did as a teenager, I didn't feel anything for them. Even when I started having sex with guys, it was sex, it was not about passion. I was never in love with a guy. I didn't understand how these other girls felt. And guys would tease them and they would play these games and it just didn't make any sense to me. What finally made sense to me was the first time I kissed a woman. And I thought, oh, this is what it's about. And I knew that I was a lesbian. And it was, I knew that I would go through hell. I would go through fire for that experience, for those kisses. I understood what that, what that was. There wasn't any words, it was just the feelings. I mean, I knew what the, the, I knew the word lesbian. I'd been reading plenty about, you know, I'd been having fantasies about, well, I had joined the first all women's judo class in New York City. And I was wrestling around on the mat with women. And of course I had a crush on the instructor. And later on I found out that this was common that young lesbians would have crushes on their gym teachers. But at that point, I didn't know. And this one woman in the class invited me. Well, we used to ride home on the subway together. We um, turned out we went to the same school. We went to college together. She had left school after high school and gotten married and traveled around with her husband, who was in the military, and then was going back to school. Um, so she was five years older than me but we were still in the same level at college. And we would talk about, you know, Zen and philosophy and poetry. And then one night she invited me over for dinner and we ended up making out on the living room rug while her husband slept in the other room. And that was when I realized that I was a lesbian and that the confusion I had was resolved. That was me gay, lesbian, homosexual, I knew all of the words. Okay, for the first, let's say, couple of years, I started with this woman, I was, uh, let me think now, I know what you're getting at. I was 18 when I um, first started having a sex with her. That was in 1961. In 1967, I joined the Daughters of Belitis after having um, looked around and been very, really disappointed, uh, disappointed with the bars. Um, I just wasn't the kind of person who was successful in the bars. And then I found the Daughters of Belitis. I had read about them in, in the book about homosexuality, and I found that they actually had a New York office. And I went there, and that was where I fit in because Instead of sitting around and drinking and trying to pick somebody up, I could talk to people. I could get to know them. They were the first 
The Daughters of Belitis was the first lesbian organization in the United States, at least that I've ever heard of. And they started in San Francisco with a small group of women, including Del Martin and Phyllis Lyons. And they uh, had the main chapter in San Francisco at first, and the New York chapter, and then I think there were some other smaller chapters in other cities. There were maybe 200 members in New York, at least on the mailing list. Now, of course, they didn't all show up for meetings. But, and there were other gay groups, but the other groups were gay men's groups, like Mattachine Society and various others. But this was the, this was the lesbian one. The Mattachine Society, I, only, I never went to their meetings except one time, and that was uh, after the Stonewall Riot, so I don't know what they did. What we did was we had um, a monthly business meeting. We would have a monthly social. Once in a while, we'd have a dance, and we would have these meetings where we'd have a guest speaker. And the guest speaker was sometimes a friendly psychologist who was there to assure us that we weren't crazy. Um, sometimes um, it was this one couple from New Jersey that had a long-standing relationship, and they were there to tell us how to make a lesbian marriage work. I forget what the other um, guest speakers were, but that was essentially the ones that happened over and over again. We participated in the, I think there were five of them all together, um, demonstrations at, in Philadelphia at Independence Hall, where a few of us would get dressed up in skirts and blouses, and the guys would all have to wear, you know, from the gay men's organizations, would have to wear suits and ties, and we'd walk around with neatly printed picket signs saying equal rights for homosexuals on July 4th. I went to one of those things, and after that I swore I'd never do it again, because I did not like, on July 4th, in a hot, sweltering day, parading around in a skirt, nylons, and a white blouse, while all of these vacationers were standing there eating ice cream and looking at us like we, we were critters in a zoo. I don't know what they were thinking. I suppose some of them thought, you know, wow, look at the queers, kind of like a freak show. Some of them might have been gay themselves and, you know, astonished that other people, that people would be out there doing this. What it did for the movement in general was there were some, it showed the world, I suppose, that there were some people who were courageous enough to stand up in public and say, we are homosexuals. And that was an important first step. Why we wore the jackets and ties and blouses was we were trying to show the world that we were ordinary, normal citizens like anybody else with just this slight difference, like being left-handed instead of right-handed. Why I didn't wear, like wearing that blouse and skirt, I had to wear those things to work. And it was 1968, the demonstration that I went to at Independence Hall. We were trying to prove, we gay people, that we were just the same as everybody else, only a little bit different, like being left-handed instead of right-handed. And I didn't believe it for a second. Not about other gay people. I mean, there were plenty of gay people who were kind of like that, or who wanted so much to be like that. Uh, they wanted to, be, to have the house with the white picket fence and the good job and fit into American society the way it was. And I had become very radicalized in that time. I no longer believed in that system. I believed in um, that the system had to be changed drastically and that um, the American society, you know, segregation that, you know, was still being fought about, the Vietnam War that I'd been demonstrating against for some years, I think for the last four years, um, all of the rules that I had grown up with and that I had hated in my guts uh, were other people were fighting against and saying, no, it doesn't have to be this way. The, you know, there was the hippie movement, there was the summer of love, all of that. And that felt more real to me 
that was more of what I wanted to be than, um, you know, the civil service job with the white blouse and all of that. What I had seen was that no matter how hard black people fought to try to be, or how nice they were, uh, I don't know if you remember the Joan Baez song, it isn't nice to block the doorway, it isn't nice to go to jail, uh, there are nicer ways to do it, but the nice ways always fail. And it had become very clear at that point that no matter how hard black people tried to be nice, there was an awful lot of white people that weren't going to let it happen. And it was only by being less than nice, that by pushing hard, by being really who we were, whether they were being black people who they were, that um, we were going to get anywhere in this world, black people, gay people, women too. Um, certainly being nice as women got us nothing but more dirty diapers. I didn't feel that I, it's not so much that I felt I was frustrated with the slow pace of it. Uh, I didn't even feel that we were making progress. I felt um, that what I was what I was doing on those marches in Philadelphia, that one march that I went to at Philadelphia, that one little protest march, was being a phony. I was pretending to want to be accepted into something I didn't want, really want any part of. And I didn't think it was going to do any good anyway. So when the Stonewall riot happened, it was like an explosion in my head. It was like, yes. And besides that, before the Stonewall riot, after that, March, but before the Stonewall Riot, um, I was working at Barnard College uh, as a secretary to the general secretary there, which was essentially a fundraising job that my boss did. And I was hanging out with Steve Donaldson of the Student Homophile League. And we were having an affair just for the hell of it, just to thumb our noses at the world. Not because we were in love with each other or even that it was good sex or anything, it was just we were being young brats. And the great gay movement couldn't really throw us out because we were perfectly willing to stand up in public and be on TV and say we were gay, even if we were having an affair with each other or whoever else we wanted. Anyway, S Steve turned me on to LSD. And that literally blew my mind, um, to use that old expression. I began to see that there were other ways of looking at the world. I literally joined the counterculture. I dropped out at the end of that uh, year at Barnard. Just before the Stonewall riot, I ex did not accept another job for the next year, and I moved down to the Lower East Side and began to work part-time and ended up being a full-time movement organizer. The homophile movement before Stonewall was essentially the Mattachine Society and Daughters of Belitis and all of these other little gay organizations, some of which were just two, two people and a mimeograph machine, two men or two women who were a couple and who were, you know, would send out, write articles and um, put out the latter, the, uh, which was a magazine of the Daughters of Belitis. Um, and it was all about civil rights for gay people. The difference between that and the Gay Liberation Front is that we, what we were was a radical organization. We were for overturning the system and liberation for everybody, not just civil rights, but, well, we were utopian, complete liberation, overturning the capitalist system, um, economic equality, overturning racism, ending the war. You know, all of these things felt like equally important, that it wasn't just, we weren't just a one-issue organization. When I was in high school, uh, my trigonometry teacher was worried about me because I was daydreaming in class. And so I got sent to a therapist, but it didn't have anything to do with being gay. Um, it was just that they were worried about me, and they were worried about a lot of kids at Bronx High School of Science because we had high... Uh, suicide attempts and actual suicides. There was, it was nerd school. It was a whole bunch of bright kids being pressured by overachieving parents or parents who wanted the kids to overachieve. And there was so much psychological pressure on the kids. So they were worried about me that I might 
um, end up like one of those kids. I did that for a couple of years and then stopped doing therapy and, you know, moved on with my life. Um, but when I was in Daughters of Belitis, there were these abnormal psych teachers who would call up and ask for a guest speaker. And I would go to an abnormal psych class and talk about being gay and why, as far as I was concerned, it was not abnormal. And that what normal was had to do with being, you know, in the middle of the bell curve. And there were some people at one end and some people at the other. And this, and, you know, like everybody in some way or another is not exactly in the middle in terms of whatever norms you set up. And what I would do in those classes, would I would take, I would take a piece of paper and tear it into little squares. And I'd pass them out to the kids. Let's say there were 30 kids in the room. And say, and ask them to write down if they had, you know, sexual experience with their own sex, sexual experience with the opposite sex, or both. But, you know, no, no names or anything. And then fold it up and hand it back to me. And then I'd unfold them and I'd say, well, this class is pretty much the same as every other class. The majority are heterosexual and there's two or three people who are not. And of course, that would leave the kids looking at each other, wondering which ones are the gay ones, and the gay ones feeling like they're not alone. And that was the whole point. The reason they had me go to these classes is that nobody else wanted to. Um, in Daughters of Belitis, the majority of the people there would not go and be in public. They wouldn't, um, they were afraid they'd lose their jobs, which was a very realistic fear. They would be, be afraid of being kicked out by their parents or alienating their families. And people very often were, you know, lost their jobs. Um, landlords would kick them out of their apartments. Um, people ended up in jails for being gay. So people had a lot of reason to be afraid. And the more you had invested in the system, the more frightened people were. This one woman that I had an affair with in, when I was in Daughters of Belitis, who was older than me, um, we were driving along in a car. She was driving. I didn't know how to drive at that point. She was driving. I didn't know how to drive at that point. And I reached over and took her hand. We were in a car. And she got frightened. She wouldn't do it. But she was afraid somebody would see. She had um, a technical writer job, and she was working for some kind of company that was related to defense or something. And she was afraid. She had a security clearance. And I had nothing to lose. If I lost my secretarial job, I could always get another one. Because I was a member of Daughters of Belitis, I was, um, they asked for a spokesperson. And I was the one who was the public speaker. When WOR Radio was looking for a spokesperson, I was the one. When um, there was some kind of a TV debate, I went on TV and I debated these two lunatic psychiatrists. I still remember them. Uh, one of them wanted to start an institute for reforming homosexuals, and I forget what the other one wanted, but I had con complete contempt for these guys. I thought they are trying to do something that I thought was impossible, which was to turn homosexuals into heterosexuals, and they're trying to um, get, get funding to do all of this, to torture people with you know, aversive conditioning, electroshock therapy, or whatever horrible things they were gonna do. So I went on TV and I debated them. The psych in those days, the psychiatrists all had this notion that um, homosexuality was a mental disorder and that it was brought about by, um, let me think now, a distant father and an overprotective mother. In other words, parents who didn't fit the roles that they were that they were supposed to fit, and therefore they didn't model the right kind of roles for their children, and so that was what caused us to be gay. It was the American Psychiatric Association that was that had this policy or this definition, and I guess they were related to the AMA because they're medical doctors. What they would do, these psychiatrists, is I mean, the ones who thought that this was a, a thing to do was they would try to talk you into being heterosexual. If that didn't work, they would do things like aversive conditioning, uh, you know, show you pornography of, that would be gay pornography and then give you an electric shock. 
and then show you straight pornography and that was supposed to be okay and you didn't get an electric shock. I suppose you got a lollipop or something. It's not so long ago and it could, and it's happening in other countries. Um, like right now, for instance, in Iran. When I first started uh, trying to find other lesbians before I got to Daughters of Belitis, um, I went to the bars a couple of times, specifically to one that I'd heard of called the Sea Colony. And the Sea Colony was in the West Village. You had to know where it was because there were the windows were blacked out. It didn't say this. I think it did say the Sea Colony, but the sign wasn't lit up. And you walked in there, blacked out again. You know, you couldn't see through the windows. And there were these women, and it was dimly lit, and you paid... Um, extra money for overpriced drinks. Everybody knew that all of these bars were owned by the mafia. And I remember going in there and looking around, and I didn't fit in at all. The women who were there who seemed to be doing well were dressed, um, either the, quote, feminine ones were dressed kind of like stewardesses, and the butch ones were dressed in suits, kind of male suits. And I, I just was like completely out of it. I wore my blue jeans and my best plaid shirt and did not fit in at all. Uh, I remember one time I sat down next to, the woman, to a woman at the bar and tr stumbled to try to make conversation with her. And she was, um, I guess she was German. And there was another woman on the other side of me who I guess must have also been German, and they took one look at me, and the two of them started singing Deutschland über alles. And I got up and walked out, and I never went back. These bars were dark. They were dimly lit. There was a back room where you could um, pay extra money and then go in and dance with another woman, and you had to pay extra to get in there. And I did that, I think, once or twice. I hated it. I hated those places. I never, uh, I never felt comfortable. I never um, connected with anyone there. I don't know if I articulated at that point that it pissed me off that the um, mafia owned the bars. I think at that point it was that what it said to me is that we gay people were outlaws. That society was telling us that we were criminals and that the only people who would deal with us were other criminals. I hated that we were being exploited by the mafia. I had no use for the mafia either. And when the Gay Liberation Front came into being and we started running our own dances and charging, you know, 50 cents for a beer and a quarter for a soda, um, the mafia hated that. They tried to stop us, but they couldn't. The police would sometimes raid the bars. I was never in one, because I didn't patronize them very much. I heard about that from other people. And usually those things would happen before an election. Um, the Whoever was running for office, or whoever was trying to get reelected mostly, would round up the prostitutes on 42nd Street and bust the gay bars, and then they'd have headlines about how they were cleaning up the city and getting rid of vice. And of course, as soon as the election was over, it would all die down. The prostitutes would be out again plying their trade. And gay people, I suppose, would go back to what they were doing, except some of the guys who got, and it was mostly guys, who got arrested would be, um, have lost their jobs, they'd be kicked out by their parents, they'd be kicked out of their apartments, and some of them committed suicide. It was um, real persecution. After Gay Liberation Front, things changed. One time they raided a bar and, this guy, and they took these guys to jail. And this guy, Diego Vinales, was here from some other country in South America. And he was here illegally and he was terrified. And he ran and jumped out of the precinct window, wherever he was, and impaled himself on a fence. And he was taken to the hospital. He survived miraculously. And we we Gay Liberation Front people did a lot of demonstrating about that, and they, I think they ended up letting him stay in this country because I think it was a death penalty or something where he came from. But we were furious. 
the way cops treated us and continued to treat gay people, you know, for some time uh, after the gay liberation movement was outrageous. People demonstrated. They, in fact, there were riots in San Francisco about it. Um, it took a long time. And in San Francisco, what changed really was they started hiring gay people, gay cops. So there are a lot of gay cops now in San Francisco, and they don't do that sort of thing anymore. In the 60s, particularly the late 60s, the cops cracked down on anybody who was um, not conventional. They were, you know, if you were pro-peace, if you were a hippie, if you were um, black, um, and if you were gay. And I don't think they made it that they were any harder on us than they were on some of these other people. I think the difference is that gay people had a harder time because they were more secretive towards their families and jobs. You couldn't be fired from your job for being black. You might not have gotten hired in the first place, but you wouldn't be fired. Um, you would definitely be fired if you you know, were caught with drugs and stuff. Um, but I suppose if you were doing, if you were a hippie and smoking dope, you probably didn't have the kind of job you could lose. For gay people, the problem was if you were caught by the police, what they would do is they would call your parents, they would call your employer, they would make sure that you got punished, not just by them for being gay, but by everybody else. Boy, that's quite a question. Um, I don't remember feeling uh, that I'm just alone against the world. I knew there were other lesbians out there. I had dark moments when I, uh, when things were going bad in other situations, and I'm thinking particularly of the night Fred Hampton got killed, when the p police raided the Black Panther headquarters in Chicago and shot this guy dead in his bed. And I was over at a friend's house in the Gay Liberation Front, and I was frightened because I thought they would do that to us, that they were perfectly capable of doing that to us. But I never felt that it was just me against the world, that I was the only gay person around. If a cop came and arrested you in a gay bar, and it was just, not just one cop, it was a bunch of them, first of all, you'd be dragged to the bar. I mean, you'd be dragged to the police. Um, you would be sometimes photographed by um, newspapers. The police would often call your employer or, you know, they caught you and you couldn't show up for work the next day because you were in jail. And, the, and if the police called your employer, you'd lose your job. And if the police called your family, your family would kick you out very often. There were a lot of gay people over and over again whose family kicked them out because they were gay. There was one person I knew who I believe her father killed her for being gay. And so you, you would lose your family, you would lose your livelihood, you would very often lose the place where you lived. And that was the scary thing. And in some cases, and I've read about this, although I never experienced it, the police would rape the women. Now, of course, you can't prove that any more than you can pr prove police abuse in a lot of other cases, but I've heard stories from women that they were sexually abused by the cops. What New York City symbolized and why gay people came there, why gay people went to San Francisco and Los Angeles, was that you did have more freedom. Um, hey, uh, Walt Whitman found that. Um, if you were in a small town somewhere, everybody knew you and everybody knew what you did and you couldn't have a relationship with a member of your own sex, period. If you came to a place like New York, you at least had the opportunity of connecting with people and finding people who didn't care that you were gay, finding an, um, the bohemian life, finding people in the arts if you were you know, artistically inclined. So, in spite of all of the problems, it was better to be in New York. Just as it was better, for instance, oh, for black people from the South to go to Detroit to get jobs in the auto factories. 
It was an improvement, it wasn't paradise. On the night of the Stonewall riot, that was June 28, 1969, it was a Saturday night, and I remember it was a hot night with a full moon. I was giving two women from Boston a tour of the village, a tour of the lesbian bars and so on, because they wanted to form a Daughters of Belitis chapter in Boston. And we passed by the Stonewall and we saw young people throwing things at cops. I did not know that they were gay people. And these two women were taken aback and they said, what's that? And I said, oh, it's just a riot. We have them in New York all the time. And we were, I mean, it was, there were all of those um, riots for, you know, because of the peace movement and for other reasons, there were always demonstrations against the war. And so I took these girls to where they were staying, and then I went home. Well, actually, I walked across the George Washington Bridge that night because the buses had stopped running, and I was going to see my lover. And I remember seeing that black river and the full, full moon. And it was only the next day that I found out that it was gay people rioting. And I hadn't had enough sleep, so I was in a somewhat feverish state, and I thought, we have to do something, we have to do something. And I thought, we have to have a protest march of our own. I called the woman who was running the Daughters of Belitis, and I said, we got to do this. And she said, well, if the Manicheen Society agrees to, let's co-sponsor it. And I, my job was to go to the Mattachine Society and co-sponsor. I mean, ask them to co-sponsor. So I went there and I spoke to the head of the Mattachine Society, and he said, well, if the membership is for it, and they were having a meeting at town hall, and there were 400 guys who showed up, and I think a couple of women talking about these riots, because everybody was really energized and upset and angry about it. And I raised my hand at one point and, and said, let's have a protest march. And Dick Leitch, who was the head of the Mattachine Society, said, who's in favor? And I didn't see anything but a forest of hands. And he said, okay, anybody who wants to organize that, go off into that corner after the meeting. So th those of us who wanted to organize it did. And we had another meeting in the Mattachine Society office during a daytime, and we organized this march. And it was the first pro, the first gay liberation march as opposed to a homophile organization march. We marched around the village, we marched past the Stonewall Inn, and then there was a little water fountain in uh, the park there. Marty Robinson stood up and made a speech. He jumped up on top of the water fountain and made a short speech. And then I made a short speech because it was you know, one for the guys, one for the girls. And then I looked around and there were all these people and what are we gonna do with them? So I said, okay, we're going home. It's over for today, but this ain't the end of it. This is just the beginning, we'll be back. And that was the end of that day. And then we met again with other people, and we started the Gay Liberation Front. And those were the gay people who were um, in left organizations, who had been told by their left organizations that they had to keep their homosexuality hidden because it would be um, a scandal for the left that to be known that it was a place where, you know, full of homosexuals. And those of us who were on the left who were in the gay organizations who were supposed to keep our left views quiet because we didn't want the um, powers that be to think that the gay organizations were a bunch of commies. Well, that was all the Gay Liberation Front. We were commie pinko queers and the hell with everybody. What the GLF did to shift the whole perspective about what, uh, what gay people were could do was that we weren't trying to say, oh, please let us in the door. Oh, please just let us be uh, nice, respectable people like you. What we were saying was we had the right to be who we were. We had the right to be whatever kind of people we were, whether we were hippies or Republicans or anything. We had just as much right as everybody else, and we didn't have to prove that we were nice in order to have the same rights that, other, that wasps had that you know, wasp republic, straight wasp Republicans had. We had the right to live and to, and to be free.
I'll have to take you a little bit back to explain what made me propose that march. When I did the radio show at Barnard College and thought I might lose my job, um, I was scared because I, my boss, I had to tell my boss I was going to be on, on that show because I knew she was going to listen to the show. And then I, found, of course, found out that she was a lesbian. But before I told her, I was really you know, worried about losing my job. It was the first time I thought I had that, I really was going to take that risk. And then I finally realized that I had to do it even if I lost my job. Because in my heart, I had always ra been raised with a notion about what would I have done if I were a Gentile in Nazi Germany? Would I have had the courage to go against the regime, or would I have been a good German? And then there was the example of Martin Luther King, and all of these affected me terribly. And what was very important to me was to have the courage to stand up for what I believed was right, and not to back down. And that was so ingrained in me, I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't go to the board, I couldn't call the radio station and say, take my segment off, I'm afraid I might lose my job. And when the riot happened, and I got the idea that we had to have a protest march, I, I t as I said, I was feeling feverish and I was lying around on my couch, not having had enough sleep, but I couldn't sleep. And I thought, we have to have a protest march. And I thought, I might get shot. There are crazy people out there. And I thought, I have to do it anyway. Because it was, would have been far worse for me to say to myself, I was a coward. I couldn't do it. I couldn't bring myself to do it than to do it and take the risk. The thing that, about the Stonewall riots that affected me was that we fought back that for the first time, as far as I knew, we weren't letting ourselves be carted off to jails. We weren't letting ourselves be uh, cowed and intimidated. That gay people were actually fighting back just the way people in the peace movement fought back. And that was so important to me. That was like, it gave me uh, a feeling of we could hold our heads high. We could stand up and fight back and not be uh, intimidated or feel ashamed of ourselves anymore. It took away the shame. And that was so important. And, it had, and we had to follow up. We couldn't just let that be a blip that disappeared. We had to continue fighting back and say, yes, we are not ashamed. We will be what we are. We will be in public what we are. Gay, right wing, left wing, crazy, Whatever we are, we're going to be that, and we're not going to let you make us ashamed of it anymore. I had been in um, anti-war demonstrations where there had been violence, although I never got hit myself. But I saw what had happened. I saw what had happened in um, the Democratic Convention in 1968 with the police riot and beat up all of these demonstrators. And when I saw, when I heard that gay people had fought back, the only thing I regretted about it was that I hadn't picked up a brick and thrown it myself. That I had not known what it was, and if I had known what it was, I would have joined in. It was time, it was time for us to stand up. It was time for us to say to the, even to the cops with their guns and everything, we will not let you do this to us anymore. People have different stories about why it happened, why it, built up in them, but I think it was the, the times, the times when people were standing up, and they were standing up all over the country for one cause or another. We had, uh, people were saying to the world, well, to the government, we're not taking this anymore, we're not letting you draft us anymore, uh, we're not going to Vietnam to, be, to kill or be killed, we're not um, letting, our, be, letting ourselves be segregated anymore. Women were saying, we're not going to put up with uh, women's roles anymore. It was the infection of the times that was taking, um, you know, it just took over. It, was the nat it felt like the natural thing to do at that point in history. 
Exactly. It was inevitable. It was inevitable that when one group started and made successes, other groups would look and say, we can do the same thing. We can be successful. We were heard by other people, but there was the almost immediate backlash. There was a constant and that's the same thing that happened with the women's movement and with the black movement. It's not that backlash happens later on. Backlash happens immediately. We, uh, a bunch of us from the Gay Liberation Front demonstrated, for instance, as Gay Liberation Front in an anti-war thing. And I think it was Pete Hamill of the New York Post, who was a liberal columnist, columnist called us the slim-waisted creeps of the Gay Liberation Front. When women started um, women's demonstrations, feminist demonstrations, the bad press was immediate. Um, it wasn't like backlash happened later on. It was immediate that we were, you know, unshaven, ugly. I didn't shave my legs, damn right. And that didn't make me ugly, but it was that, you know, they, we were always portrayed as the reason that we were feminists, or the reason that we were lesbians, the reason that we, you know, did what we did is because we couldn't get a man. Not that we didn't want a particular man. It was like almost any man is, uh, if you can get one, <laughs> you know, that would make you happy. And if you couldn't get one, that would make you unhappy. And that's why you would fight for equal pay or um, decent child care or any other human right under the sun. I can see about... Uh, I can think about it now, the idea of being comfortable in our correct position. I think the correct position would be missionary position, right? Um, Craig Rodwell was, he started the Oscar Wilde bookstore and he had a really good collection of gay books and he was public. I mean, people would go to his bookstore and buy stuff and the cops didn't intimidate him to, uh, into closing the thing down. And he backed the Gay Liberation Front. He wasn't part of the Gay Liberation Front, but he um, wasn't scared of us either. He wasn't, he wasn't afraid that, to let a whole different um, variety of gay people be in existence. He didn't feel that we all had to do the white shirts and tie things. I used to go to his bookstore. I patronized it. Um, I liked the guy, I used to hang out and talk with him sometimes. What happened with our protest march, and it was a protest march, is that it became an annual parade and it became very commercialized. And we still have um, organizations in it that are non-commercial, um, but from my point of view, speaking just as an individual, I find it too commercial, too many bars blasting disco music, uh, too many people peddling their wares. I think Stone, the Stonewall Riot and all of the subsequent organizational activities that took place um, have made a huge difference in how people see gay people. When the former vice president's daughter can be openly lesbian and have a baby with her partner, and the vice president isn't absolutely um, hung from a lamppost or forced to resign in shame, you know things have changed in this country. When the current prime minister of Iceland is an open lesbian and nobody seems to care about that, that's made a huge difference. What struck me as the hugest difference at one point, and this was some years ago, when there was a gay and lesbian film festival in the city of Tomsk in central Siberia, I thought, we are actually making progress in this world. Stonewall was a leap forward that made all of this possible. The Gay Liberation Front made all of this possible, not just Stonewall, because the riot could have been buried. It could have been a few days um, in the local newspaper, and that was that. But the organization, the Gay Liberation Front, and all the subsequent Gay Liberation Fronts around the country, and all of the other gay organizations that grew out of that, made sure that that riot didn't disappear and that the Stonewall riot was a leap in consciousness because, because of the Gay Liberation Front and because of all of the organizations that sprang out of that. We made sure 
that that riot didn't get buried in history. We made sure that gay people could hold our heads up in pride and that it happened all around the country and that it happened in other countries. We connected with other gay people and we made sure that we would never be burying our heads in shame again.